This woman seduced the jailer several times in prison for revenge. She only wanted to give birth to a boy and have him grow up to avenge her. A few years ago, Sayu and her son followed her husband to the village to teach, but they were stopped by four bullies at the entrance of the village. These four bullies were about to extort the villagers for their safety. Sayu and her husband's family arrived just in time to be stopped by them. The bullies framed Sayu's husband as a bad guy in order to make a show for the villagers. He was here to oppress the farmers of the village. Without waiting for Sayu's husband to explain, they killed him. Sayu held her husband's body and cried. She looked at the four enemies and vowed to take revenge. But how can a weak woman survive in the hands of these demons? She could only watch her son lose his life. She was abused by her enemies for three days and nights. The enemies wiped out Sayu's family and swindled money from the villagers. One of the men saw Sayu's beauty and took her as his wife to Tokyo to open a restaurant. And Sayu has been forced to smile and bear the humiliation. Sayu finally found a chance to eliminate him, but she was sentenced to life in prison for murder. Her enemies are still alive. How can she easily extinguish the flame of revenge? Even being locked up in prison doesn't stop Sayu's anger. She suffers the loss of her husband and son and seduces her jailers, despite the criticism of her fellow inmates, because she wanted to give birth to a strong son to continue her wolf for revenge. On a snowy night, the cry of a baby girl breaks the cold night of the women's prison. Sayu, who had a difficult delivery, knew she wouldn't live long. She looked at her daughter Yuki in her infant clothes. She said Yuki was a child from hell. Yuki's life was only about revenge. Yuki's arrival was like the snow outside the window. As long as the hatred does not stop, the snow does not stop. She named her daughter Shura Yuki and wanted the blood of her enemies to soak the snow. Sayu died with hatred. Afterwards, Sayu Selma entrusted Yuki to an old monk to learn martial arts. Yuki, who was born for revenge, was like the flower of hell that was to be irrigated with blood. She was forced to abandon her emotions under the cruel train of the old monk and accept the mission of revenge. Yuki did not cry out in pain when she was cut. Instead, she licks her wounds. Her eyes are as sharp as a bloodthirsty beast. She has completely abandoned her gender and become an inhuman being. She exists to take revenge. When she grew up, Yuki was very beautiful, but there was no emotion in her frown. Now Yuki is alone in martial arts and plans to go down to the mountains for revenge. A snowy day is also a bloody day. A kimono woman holding a purple umbrella slowly walked from afar. Her face is cold and her gaze is cold. She stopped the carriage of the gang in the street. The guards scolded the woman and told her to go away. Yuki didn't say anything either. She flew up in the air and pulled out a long knife from the umbrella handle and spun it around, breaking the guard's arm immediately. The rest of the guards rushed to fight with her. Yuki raised her umbrella to block the attack. After a few minutes, the gang members were all dead. Yuki then went to the slum area and found the leader of the local gang. She's already taken care of the gangsters who were bullying them, so they wanted to pay her. Then she gave a list to the small organization. The people on the list were the people Yuki had been looking for for a long time. A few days later, Yuki got the location of enemy number 3 and enemy number 1 out of the 3 enemies from the organization. So she went after enemy number 3 first. Now the enemy number 3 is not a good person. His daughter is selling her body upstairs to earn money for his medical treatment. But he is gambling with the money downstairs. Today his luck was not good and he was about to lose all his money. So he tried to cheat. But he was caught by the casino and beaten up. Yuki saved him and took him to the beach. The sea breeze at night was particularly cold. What was even colder was Yuki's eyes. Yuki explained her intention directly. Enemy number three immediately knelt down and begged for mercy. He said that if he died, what would happen to his daughter? But Yuki, who came to earth with hatred, did not care about his tears. With a flash of the sword, enemy number three fell to the ground. His body sank into the sea. The blood stained the waves in the sea to a shocking shade of blood. Yuki looked at the sea dyed red by his blood and felt a great pleasure. She only had two enemies left, but the reality disappointed Yuki. Yuki followed the clues to find her enemy number one, but found only a grave. Yuki, who had been practicing swordplay for the sake of revenge, looked at the tombstone of her enemy and was furious. She drew her sword and cut the tombstone to pieces. And all this was seen by Ashio. Ashio is a novelist. He thought there must be a story in Yuki's body. So he followed Yuki hoping to get material for his story. Yuki didn't hesitate to tell him to get lost. But Yuki's story was still written by Ashio. The story of Lady Snowblood is a household name. And the story was provided by Yuki's master, the old monk. The old monk told Yuki that instead of searching for enemy number two in a sea of people, she should let enemy number to know that they exist and come 
to them. And the enemy numbered was also taken in by the plan. She had Ashiya kidnapped and tortured him to reveal the location of Yuki. Ashiya refused to betray Yuki to death. Just as enemy number two was getting angry and ready to kill Ashiya, a man outside the door told her to stop. He said he could use Ashiya to lure Yuki out. He would find a way to inform Yuki. Then just number two obediently obeys the order. Ashiya, who was in a daze, heard this voice and felt very familiar. Under the arrangement of the men outside the door, Yuki learned that Ashiya had been captured by enemy number two and came to rescue him. A purple umbrella floats into the courtyard. A white dress with a sword landed. Yuki's body is as agile as a dragon swimming in the sea. The speed of her sword was like a poisonous snake. The guards reacted and surrounded Yuki. A great battle was about to take place. One of the guards stabbed Yuki in her left arm before she was able to get away. Blood slipped down. Yuki's eyes grew fierce and her murderous aura spread out. She rushed into the crowd again with her sword in her right hand. In a flash, white figures were flying and red blood was splashing. The guards fell down one after another. Yuki saves Ashiya after a bitter battle but lets her enemy number to escape through a secret passage. Yuki found the entrance to the secret passage but found his enemy number to had hanged herself. Yuki feels that he has been avenged but she doesn't know where she is going. But Ashiya told Yuki that the enemy number two shouldn't have killed herself. The man was determined to slash his father for the sake of his girlfriend. However, he was shot several times by his father. A few days ago, an unexpected guest came to Ashiya's house. Ashiya was nervous at first but then relaxed. He said you're not dead, enemy number one. Ashiya said he heard the voice of the man outside the door when he was arrested by his enemy number two. He suspected that enemy number one was not dead at all. Now it seems to be true. Hater number one didn't want to kill Ashiya who had learned his identity. He told Ashiya to stop updating the novel Lady Snowblood. He said that everything has come to an end with the death of the enemy number two. He also asked Ashiya to join his side. Ashiya could come to Kagome to find him if he wanted to. After that, Ashiya left. On the way, he passed by Yuki who was looking for Ashiya. Ashiya met Yuki and told her that his enemy number one was not dead. He also told Yuki a cruel truth that Ashiya is the son of his enemy number one. It turns out that three years ago, the enemy number one was wanted for breaking the law. So he designed to blow himself up. After that, the enemy number one changed his identity and continued to break the law. Now he has successfully entered the high society with his arms business. But the father and son relationship is not good. That's why Ashiya didn't know about his enemy number one as fraudulent death. Maybe it was because he was thinking of his family. Ashiya wanted to advise Yuki not to be impulsive. But he looked at Yuki's resentful eyes, thinking of all the crimes committed by his enemy number one and the endless resentment of Yuki's family for degenerations. Ashiya decided to destroy his father. He took Yuki into the Kagamine Hall under his own identity. A costume party is being held here, but Yuki soon found her enemy number one in the crowd. She rushed after him, but found that he was gone. She looked into the room and found a secret door in the wall. She followed the secret room and went after her enemy number one. After a hard battle, she was finally able to fight with her enemy number one to the death. The enemy number one pulled out his pistol and aimed at Yuki. Ashio rushed to his father, but enemy number one also shot his son several times without mercy. Yuki swung over from the other side with the help of a chandelier, but she hesitated when she saw the father and son hugging each other. She was worried about Ashio's safety. Ashio saw her hesitation and shouted that he was hopeless and told Yuki to act quickly. Yuki remembered her mission and hatred at the critical moment, so she didn't hesitate anymore. A sword pierced through the two of them who were hugging each other tightly, but the enemy number one shot at Yuki before he died. Yuki raised her sword in pain and let her enemy number one go to hell. Yuki, who had gotten her wish, looked at her dead lover in grief. She stumbled to the street. Somehow it had snowed as if the night she was born. She lived to take revenge. Her mission was now complete. Yuki didn't know where she should go from here. At that moment, the daughter of her enemy number three suddenly rushed out and stepped Yuki in the belly with a knife. Yuki looked at her enemy number three as daughter with pity and smiled. She felt pity because she saw a poor person like her. She smiled because maybe she was relieved. Yuki hobbled a few steps with her wounds and then collapsed in the snow. No one knows whether she is alive or dead. The title of this film is Lady Snowblood, Shura Yuki Hing who is always thinking of revenge, is a poor person. Yuki looks at the greedy and corrupt sinner without emotion, but she has no way back. There is no external force to support her. She has no pity. She has no pity either for herself or for others. Because all this is meaningless, she doesn't care if she has a future or not. She has no mother and no father. Her mother, who gave her life, died. Her father, 
who is not related to her, died even earlier. She doesn't even know who her real father is. Her life was all about revenge. Yet everyone knew that even if she killed her enemies, Yuki's revenge was ultimately unsuccessful. She sacrificed her only warmth and hope for revenge. And when she succeeded in her revenge, she also became the avenged. Shura's flower fades as its petals fall to the ground. The hot blood melted the cold snow. Yuki returned to the moment of her mother's near death. Her heartbreaking wail. She was powerless and desperate. Yuki was named after the snow. Born of hate and died of hate. She blossomed in the snow and withered in the snow.